me start with the agenda. Just a couple of um, introductions I want to do. So for those that don't know me, my name is um, Sam, Sam Fanshaw, and I'm one of the event directors at Racing the Planet. Um, I have been to Antarctica uh, three times so far for the last desert, uh, and it is an amazing place. And I'm looking forward to going again um, at the end of this year, hopefully. Uh, also on this call is Mary Gadams. Mary is our founder of Racing the Planet and has been to every single edition of The Last Desert. So she's been to um, nine, I've been to Antarctica nine times so far, and she'll be sharing some of her um, insights into um, The Last Desert and Antarctica and um, what she um, can share with you to, to make it helpful as you're thinking about the race yourself. And then also on the call is Tony Brammer. Um, so Tony um, has completed the last desert some years ago. He's completed all four, four deserts and also is a member of the, um, the management team specifically at the races. So he's going to be um, answering some questions in the chat as well. So, so here to start with is the agenda. Um, hopefully this is what you're expecting to hear. And they said if there's anything not covered, please um, hold your questions and, and you can ask them at the end. So we're going to do an introduction to the last desert and to Antarctica. We're going to talk about the itinerary, um, so how the schedule works for the race. Um, a little bit of information about the expedition ship that we use for the race as transportation to Antarctica and for base camp and effectively our home during the race. Um, then the format of the race, which is really important because this is a bit which is a little bit different to um, the other four deserts races. Um, again, I think those people who are planning to come already are aware of this, but it's, it is important and I'll be going into that in, in a reasonable amount of detail. Then I will um, share some of the locations for or some of the location options for each of the stages. Um, briefly mention the friends and family experience that we have as, a, as an, op an option um, at the last desert. Um, and then finally, we'll go on to some frequently asked questions, some top tips, and then open it up for Q&A um, to all of you. So starting um, with what is the last desert and a little bit of information about Antarctica, I am going to pass over to Mary, um, who said she's been there nine times so far, and uh, she's going to share everything that she knows about it, which is um, a quite extensive um, knowledge. So over to you, Mary. Uh, hi there. So for, for those of you um, who I haven't met, um, my name is Mary Gadams and I set up Racing the Planet um, in two, 2002. And the plan for setting up the Four Deserts um, Ultra Marathon Series was always to have a race in the, in the Antarctic. So um, uh, starting in two, 2006, um, I set up a multi-day race in, in the a Antarctic. And the first year we did in 2006, we actually flew from uh, Chile and landed on King George Island. It, it was a be beautiful experience in um, flying, and but I thought that really the best way to see the Antarctic was to do it um, through Argentina and the Drake Passage. Having, having really fell in love with, with the Ant Antarctic after reading Shackleton's book, uh, probably when, when I was about 21, um, I just felt like everyone needed the experience of crossing the Drake Passage um, to finally get to this uh, beautiful um, co continent. So just um, briefly, um, so what, what is the last desert? It is the only multi-stage race in the Antarctic. Um, actually, this will, will be my ninth time going. Um, I can honestly say it's probably um, one of the best things that I've ever done in my entire life. Um, and every time that I go there, it's always different and, and just as special. Um, it's 250 kilometers or 155 miles over six stages. So we, we typically go to up to six different places. Um, and it is, it is a chance to experience the, the Antarctic in, in a way that, that hardly anyone else really can. You will really experience what it's like to, um, to run or walk over the 
terrain and in deep snow. You will have every type of weather. Definitely mo most days you, you will have four, four seasons in, in each day. And only about 350 people in the world have, have ever finished the race. So get, get ready for the unexpected. It is the the Antarctic is the most pristine place that I've that I've ever seen. Um, you will experience penguins. You'll see seals. You'll see you know different different types of birds. You will likely see um, whales. You will spend up up to 12 hours on shore each day. Um, the typical tourist who uh, visits the Ant Antarctic, they will either either spend no time or shore, on shore or they'll, they'll probably spend less, less than, than an hour on shore. So it is, it really um, taking part in, in the race is truly an, an epic way to, to see this, this beautiful continent. But every every single day we, we are we are dictated by the weather. So the one thing you, you have to be ready for is to um, be you know changing everything that you thought you you would be doing each day. So now I'm uh, going to pass it back over to Sam, and Sam is going going to first e explain exactly where where the Antarctic is. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So uh, I think most of you probably do know where Antarctica is, but these interesting maps give you an idea of how it relates. So it's in the very, very south. But when you look at it from Antarctica up, you see that it's south of South Africa, um, south of Australia, south, I suppose, of New Zealand uh, and also south of um, South America. And as Mary mentioned already, this is, if you're going to go by ship, this is the shortest, is cross, shortest crossing, which is why that we go from, from um, South America. And looking a little bit more, so this is Antarctica itself, where you can see quite a little bit closer up um, how close Argentina is uh, to the bottom of it here relatively, and then how huge uh, Antarctica is. Um, and this peninsula here is the part that, that we primarily focus on um, for the last desert. So talking about the itinerary for uh, the last desert. So as mentioned, we go from Argentina. The host town is Ushuaia, the very, very tip of Argentina. Um, and racers need to, or participants need to get to, to that location. And that's where we will meet. Um, the race schedule officially starts from when we meet in Ushuaia just before we then board the ship. Uh, and it finishes when we disembark from, from the ship also back in Ushuaia. Um, so 2021, it's 13 days and 12 nights um, from Ushuaia to Ushuaia and then plus the travel time for you to, to um, get to and from Ushuaia. And the entry fee includes almost everything once you board the ship, but you do need to consider your travel to Ushuaia uh, and also um, the mandatory equipment, as well as a few other little bits and pieces, like if you want to stay longer in Ushuaia, um, then you will need to also consider um, hotel prices there, but there are a lot of good options. Looking at how it works, so basically on the first day of the race schedule, uh, we will meet you in um, Ushuaia and we have a meeting location uh, for the first meeting, but we will see you, I'm sure, in the days before and you will see each other as well as we recommend you arrive a couple of days early, um, partly to ensure that there's no problem with the travel or your luggage arriving um, and partly to acclimatise and enjoy Ushuaia and this part of, of Argentina, which really is a great, great place in itself. We then we board the ship in the afternoon on, on that day, which in this year is going to be the 11th of November. Um, we have introductions, we have a lifeboat drill, you get shown to your, your cabins, um, and then we do the equipment check actually in the cabins. So we come round to your cabins and do it and do it there. You do need to make sure that you have all of your equipment beforehand or to ask us any questions before because the ship is then um, moving and so there is no chance to then go back to Ushuaia and purchase anything extra. Uh, and then we set, so we've set sail on that set very same day and you have about 12, more than 12 hours in, in um, calm waters, waters that are almost always calm before we hit the Drake Passage, which can be a little less calm. It is definitely part of the adventure 
Um, it makes you feel a little bit more like the early polar explorers when they were getting across to Antarctica. It's not an easy place to get to uh, and crossing the Drake Passage makes it feel like, like that's the case. We're at sea for normally two days to get there, more or less, depending on, on the weather and assuming that the first um, stage is in King George Island, which is in the Shetland um, Islands, which, uh, sorry, in the, in the South Shetland Islands, which is the first part of landmass for Antarctica that you will reach when you come from um, Argentina. At that point, um, we will give you um, plenty of notice um, because with, for the first stage, it's a little bit easier of what, what we have planned. Um, and once we arrive in those calmer waters, you'll start to see icebergs for some time before. Um, and, and then you will have a good amount of time to prepare and be ready for stage one. I will start talking later on about the format of the race and how it works each, each day. So I'm not gonna talk a lot more here about the day-to-days, but then you have basically, we have those um, days from the 14th to the 20th of November. So we're talking about a full, a full week um, in Antarctica. We'll be moving for different locations where each stage takes place in a completely new location. Um, before we conclude at the final stage, everyone goes back to the ship again. Um, we will then start our voyage back um, across the Drake Passage back to um, Ushuaia in Argentina. And we'll have again, normally um, 30, to 30 hours to two days at sea, depending on, on what the weather is like and where our last location stop is. Um, again, for the last 12 hours plus we enter um, what, what will be calmer waters. Sometimes the Drake Passage is calm, um, but certainly it will be um, calmer to start with. We have the awards banquet on board the ship once we get closer to Ushuaia in those uh, calm waters. And then we will arrive um, into Ushuaia at the very latest by early morning on the 23rd of November or on the last day of the trip. So we're normally in and ready to disembark by 9 a.m. on that final day. So for the 2021 case, um, on that would be on the 23rd of November. The expedition ship itself. So this basically becomes, it's our transport to Antarctica. It's also our base camp. So instead of sleeping on Antarctic shore and camping on Antarctic shore every night, we are sleeping on the ship. Uh, and it basically becomes your home for the week, your home for the race. A little bit more about the ship. So it's flying the Dutch flag. Uh, it's a reinforced, um, uh, it's been reinforced, a ship that's been reinforced for moving through ice. Um, and it, it has made many voyages to Antarctica and is, is built for this kind of expedition. It's the sixth time we'll be using this specific ship for the last desert uh, in 2021. In total, it can hold 108 passengers in 52 cabins and has 47 staff. And that's everything from the ship staff to the catering staff to the um, to the expedition teams and, and anything else along the way. The ship is 89 meters long and 14 meters wide uh, and our participants will all sleep in in twin um, or occasionally triple cabins that have private bathrooms. Uh, on board the ship there is a restaurant, a lecture room, um, an observation lounge, um, three outdoor decks and you also have access to the bridge which is where the captain sails the, the ship from. Um, meals are provided when we're on board, um, primarily during race time that will be breakfast and dinner because we'll be out on shore uh, racing in between that um, but our schedule changes a lot and you do need to also consider because the, the schedule can change a lot to make sure that you have some and it's, it's all in the mandatory list but make sure you have some food options for in between um, stages or if something changes so that if we're starting very, very early and they're not able to have breakfast ready for us, that you have uh, an option for breakfast before you go and start a long stage. So it's a little different to the others, uh, the other races in that way, um, but you do, it does mean you need to be a little bit more prepared for it all. However, don't be mistaken, this is not an easy race. Um, and many people have said it to me after doing the last desert, um, is that saying they thought it was going to be just a bit of fun, that we're going to be running on the ice with the penguins and then we'll be back on the ship because we're staying in warm cabins and you have hot showers and ensuite bathrooms, but it's still a tough race. So uh, do not be, be fooled by the fact that we're on board a, uh, a ship and sleeping there rather than camping. 
a few photos here to, to give you uh, an idea. Down at the bottom here, it gives you a, an idea of the size, of what it looks like. And here you can see an idea of some of the cabins. So it's not a luxury ship by any means, um, but it is quite comfortable for the time that we're on board of it. Okay, the very, very important part. So the format of the race. So the most important thing to make sure that you are aware of is that The Last Desert is, is based on time rather than distance. So in a normal Four Deserts race, the distance is 250 kilometers. Everyone starts at the same time and then you get to the end point having completed the same distance and your time will be different. In Antarctica, because of the conditions there, um, because it is so um, challenging, should I say, both with the weather and the terrain uh, and the remoteness, is that we, we do it based on time. So everybody is on shore, all races are on shore for the same amount of time. And it's about how far you can um, run or how many kilometers you can complete on each of the courses, on each of the stages in that time. <clears throat> um, and the winner is the person who completes the most distance in the given time. Hopefully that's clear, but we'll come on to a little bit more later on that will make it clearer. It is based on a plan of distance uh, and the time that we have on each of the locations reflects on this. And these distances, however, are based on the, um, the, person at the, the person or the people at the very, very front. So there's no minimum distance that you're required to run as long as you're out there and on the course and moving other than obviously um, short breaks for filling up at checkpoints, eating at checkpoints and, and toilet stops. As long as you're, you're keeping on moving, there's no minimum distance that you have to complete, but you have to be there on shore completing the course for the set amount of time. So stage one is generally a long stage, which is quite hard after um, as the first one to start with, but you have had time to hopefully rest and not, not struggle too much with the, with the uh, challenge of the crossing um, of the Drake Passage, um, but you will be well rested in, in your muscles and in your body. And then you can see the distances, the idea of the distances going on from there. <clears throat> Talking specifically on the schedule of a stage. <clears throat> so the first thing is that we will give you not a full stage briefing, but at least the, uh, an idea of the location, the course distance, the start time and the time that you'll be on shore the day before um, or as much notice as possible. And normally the day before the, um, the stage is going to start. Then you'll normally have minimum a two hour warning of when we are going to be um, ready to, to um, to disembark from the ship and get to shore for the stage to start. Um, so you've been told already the night before roughly when it's going to be and then you'll get, get a, 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 normally a good two hour warning in advance. In that two hours you need to just make sure we pack your bag for the stage, make sure everything's in your drop bag. Most of this won't have changed from, from the previous stage. Assemble in the, um, in, in the central place in the ship for um, a more detailed briefing and instruction about the, the stage. Um, and then you'll meet with your buddy. That's normally going to be your, your, um, the person that you're sharing the cabin with. And it's really important in Antarctica that you do have one other person that you have um, agreed is going to be your buddy for, for, the, for the time that we're in Antarctica to make sure that you get back onto the ship, that you've left the ship so that everybody is aware of your whereabouts. And there is a specific process of that with, for doing that as well um, in terms of clocking a card in and clocking a card out um, but we also have this this buddy system just for getting on and off the ship not and, and being on the ship but not obviously when you're racing. We then take a zodiac um, and I'll talk more about the zodiac boats in a minute to get to shore and you and make your way to the start line. The start line is often right where the zodiacs land but it can be a, a kilometre or so's walk away as well. You then have a little time at the start line to prepare for the race. By that, I mean, you may be wearing additional clothing on the Zodiac to get across there. Um, so you need to take that off, put it in your drop bag, which again, I will talk a little bit more about um, in, in the next couple of slides uh, and get everything ready to, to go uh, before the race starts. Then the race is the race. So you're in there, out there for a set amount of time. Um, I'm not going to talk about how it works in terms of, of um, scoring and coming around again now, but it's basically you're out there 
on the course um, for X amount of time. And at the checkpoint or checkpoints that you go through, they will alert you of any changes. On completion of the stage, so when the time is reached, um, whether it's the agreed time, an earlier time or an extended time, which can happen, you then have access to your drop bag again. You don't in, in during the stage itself, um, but you can then so have a change of clothes or put on your big, your big parka jacket to make sure that you stay warm, access to other food, shoes, whatever it is that you need from there before we return to the ship by Zodiac. Uh, once you're back on the ship, it's then time to recover, change, shower, hot showers. Um, normally, depending on which stage it is, then come for dinner and we'll give you a short briefing for the next stage. Um, and then that's when you will hopefully have the chance to, uh, to rest for the next stage. One thing that is very important with everything in Antarctica, and Mary has touched on it already, is that you have to prepare for the unexpected. And this is possibly one of the biggest challenges of the last desert is that the plan is set uh, and it should be like that. But because the weather is so unpredictable and the conditions down in Antarctica can change so fast that we have to make decisions um, very often to make sure that uh, everyone stays safe. So the start time may change, the distance of the course may change the end time may change. And all of these changes can happen in advance of you starting the stage, um, just as you're about to start or during the stage itself. Um, other things, the time on the course um, can, can also change. And a stage, it could be more than a day. Normally the stages are maximum around 14 hours, um, but it could be longer um, for various different reasons. And it is possible that a stage is a very short um, time and you could have two stages in one day. Um, in that case, it's likely to be in different locations, but it's just to get your mindset around the race that anything can, can happen. And everything depends on the weather and the weather conditions. So as we were talking about the format of the race itself, here is an example from a previous edition of the race. So on this race, we had five stages. We always um, aim to get six, but it's not unusual to have just four or five stages. Um, the first one was on King George Island. They started at 7.15 and they were out, the, the time for the, um, for the stage was until 5 p.m. So it was nine hours, 45 minutes. The course distance was 15 kilometers. And the leader, the person who completed the most kilometers in this stage completed 80 kilometers and the person who completed the least completed 33. You can see here the details going down here. So we had a stage of three and a half hours. We have a stage of two hours and we had course distances um, varying. The last one being very, very short. That was really more of a, um, a, a ceremony, but it can be um, a very short stage distance. Um, in, in, in certain cases. So the total time for this race, everybody was on the course for 26 hours and 42 minutes. Uh, and the most distance completed was 252. And the least distance completed was 82 kilometers. I think that that gives, gives you a, a picture of, of what I've said about in the theory and the plan, and then a, a reality. So moving on now um, in terms of the Zodiacs and how we get to shore. So Zodiacs basically are rubber boats. Um, they're not that much different to boats that you that you may see when you are, um, uh, well, anywhere else in the world, I suppose. Um, and they take you from the ship to the shore. They carry uh, up to 10 people. It may be slightly less depending on the weather conditions and the amount of luggage going on shore. There's 10 Zodiacs uh, on the ship, so they go in rotation, they're coming back. So it's not everybody leading, leaving together and, and you can only load one or two at a time safely from, from the ship. Um, you may need to, sorry, not paddle, that's the wrong word. You may need to, um, uh, you may not be directly going on shore. You may have to go through the water and we provide, or the ship provides um, waterproof boots, so Wellington boots um, to wear from there. So there's an example of where you'd be changing your shoes at the start line and the kind of prep that you would need to do there. So locations for the stages. <clears throat> 
So as an idea, there's more than 20 uh, locations that we've used over the, the years that we've held the, the last desert. And we're looking at between four and six normally um, for each of the additions. The most common, so common is the wrong word, the, the most, the ones that we try to use most often because they work really well for the race is King George Island. Um, and you can see that's on the South Shetland Islands, which is the first um, part of land that we come from. Argentina is, is going off to the north here. Um, Deception Island, which is a really fascinating island, I'll talk about it in a moment. Uh, and some of the others here, which are down um, a little bit further down into Antarctica and on the peninsula, including some locations on the um, Antarctic mainland itself. So it's all Antarctica, but these ones obviously are islands of Antarctica, and some of these ones are partly islands and some of them are on the mainland itself. The reason we focus on the peninsula is because it's so beautiful and has so many much more wildlife than you have in the center uh, of Antarctica and there's so much variety of, of what Antarctica has to offer compared to, to going say to the South Pole. Um, so here I have just a few examples where you can see some photos of, of some of the main locations. So King George Island in the South Shetland Islands. Um, this is probably one of the, the more inhabited um, parts of Antarctica. It has multiple research bases and you can see them, them here in the background in a bit like um, cargo containers. Um, but this first picture here, when you get away from the research base, bases, um, it is very, very different looking. There is an airstrip on King George Island. They, they actually have a church um, and it's the location where we can normally have the longest course. Uh, and this is the one we try to get to first and which we um, have as long as we can um, on the island, hoping to get um, 100 kilometers in for the for the leader, leaders of the race. Um, the terrain in King George Island is, I think you can see a little bit of it here, like it's definitely still snow and there's ice and it can be slushy, but because it is semi-inhabited, there are some tracks um, that can be used. So sometimes it's a little bit more gravelly, which means that it's relatively normally slightly easier terrain than perhaps um, when you get down into the deep Antarctic. Uh, another location we use quite often or we try to use is Deception Island. So you can see down here in the bottom right um, what the island looks like. So it used to be a volcano that imploded on itself. So now it has a cal caldera in the middle of it. So it's water in the middle and we, we sail into the middle of it. Um, uh, and we will land in one of these locations around here and have a stage on the island. Um, it is still has some volcanic activity um, and so it has thermal waters, although it's not deemed to be um, fully active um, at any risk of, 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 of any um, major activity. Um, you can see there where there's the black beaches there, that's where there is some thermal activity there. Um, and so the ground is a little warmer, so there's not snow on it. And it's also was a location of a whaling station um, over the, the so some decades ago, but you can see here it's got the remainders of it. So it's quite historic um, in, in what you will see there and quite different to what you won't see in the rest of Antarctica where there's very, very little buildings. And here's a picture of running along the, the, the beach, the thermal beach um, on Deception Island. And here, when you go um, a little further up, it, you get up into some quite rocky um, and, and hilly terrain there. Um, another location, uh, one of my favorite Paradise Bay, it really is beautiful. Um, this was on a sunny day, which also helps. Um, and this is, Paradise Bay is actually on mainland Antarctica itself. Um, it's, it, I mean, the photos, um, I, I will leave you with the photos to say more, but this is another uh, location that we try to use and it's one on, on Antarctica mainland. And then the final location I'm just gonna give examples of here so you can see the, the difference and, and what they look like is uh, Damoy Point, sometimes known as Dorian Bay, which is on Winker Island. And it's the location of the only post office in Antarctica where it's also possible to get your passport stamped um, on there. But you can see a photo here um, of this location, a little more here, and then there's another one there. So I'm not gonna go through all of the other locations um, today. Uh, I would love to because it's the photos really do Antarctica justice, um, but I want to make sure that you get enough details to understand how it works um, and help, help you prepare and understand it. 
So I'm going to move on now to equipment for, for the last desert or for racing in Antarctica. So specifically, there's, there's some minor um, additions to your, that, so there are some additions to the normal equipment list, but nothing is truly specialized. So we, the last desert, like the other um, racing the planet ultras, are for, don't, you don't have to have any specific skills in terms of mountaineering or, or cold weather or ice axe or crampons or the like. So there's no very specialized equipment. To make sure I'm clear, and I think I have said it so far, is that you have to carry everything um, that you need for a specific stage. And I've said some of the stages can be very, very long, um, 12 to 14 to 16 or even longer hours. Um, but in between the stages, when you go back to the ship, you can change the equipment that you have. So you can take multiple options of, of things like taking two pairs of shoes or taking a lot of pairs of socks to make sure that you can always start a stage with a with dry socks. So during a stage, you have to carry everything and you don't have access to your drop bag either. But in between stages, you can change your equipment around. For every single stage of the last desert, you have to have a drop bag. Um, this can be accessed before the race starts on shore and after the race finishes or the stage finishes on shore so that when you're getting back to the Zodiac, you have you can access it. But during the stage itself, you cannot access it. And the main purpose of the drop bag is the two reasons. One is as soon as you finish racing, you will feel cold very quickly um, when you're when you're moving. It's not so bad. But when you stop, you do feel cold. You have to get back onto the Zodiac and back to the ship. And even if the Zodiac is right, right by the start point or finish point, uh, and it's only a short ride, um, you still will get wet, get cold. And as I said there are times when you might have to walk up to a kilometer maximum um, to get to the to the Zodiac in order to get back to the ship. And then it can be a ride of more like 15 minutes opposed to two minutes uh, on the Zodiac. So you need to have something at the very least your parka and also possible your possibly your rubber boots um, to um, make sure that you are, stay safe and dry and warm after the stage and is finished and before it starts. The second reason for the drop bag is if for any reason we weren't able to get back to the ship, uh, let's say that the winds had got up and it was not safe for the Zodiacs to, to travel um, or to take passengers back to the ship, which is very rare because we're extremely cautious, but it's possible, then you have the equipment in your drop bag to be able to stay on shore for longer um, until it's safe to get back to the, to the ship. Um, and I'll talk shortly about what needs to be in the drop bag. Uh, another key general point for equipment in Antarctica is the food. Um, so you only need the food that you're to carry the food for the stage that you're on, but there are very strict rules about um, having food on the shore in Antarctica, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So it takes a bit of planning. As with all the other races, there is a detailed equipment list. Here is the summary contents page. Um, and I think a lot of people, most people on here have seen one of our equipment lists before. So you'll know the detail that we, we go into with it. Um, or you can go to the website and you can download the equipment list to look at it in full. <laughs> um, many of the items are exactly the same. Some are similar to, to any of the other races, but some specific items to be aware of. So you need a larger 65 litre waterproof bag, um, which acts as your drop bag. You need to have micro spikes, which are, it's not a different shoe, but it's a, a spike um, contraption that you put on over the top of your shoe. And we do require you to have a specific brand because some of the brands that are out there fall off easily. Um, and we did once have someone um, have a set that fell off and it meant that we were leaving and they couldn't find it and it was left behind in Antarctica, which we don't want to do anything there. The brand we re require is called Cthulhu. Gators, so obviously gators isn't something new for a desert race, but the ones for Antarctica are very different to the to the ones that you need for the sand. Um, uh, you can look on, on the equipment list to see exactly what I mean, but you're looking for waterproof longer ones uh, rather than very lightweight ones that stop sand getting through. Uh, waterproof trousers, I put it here, it's quite simple, but it's not for most of the other races and it really they really are very important and you probably probably possibly end up wearing them for most of the time for most of the stages as they keep the wind out as well as the rain and because the weather changes so much you've got sleet you've got snow being blown at you uh, and they do offer a layer of, of protection against the warmth uh, the cold as well 
The tops are, are talking about lots of different weights of tops. And again, you don't have to carry all of them all the time. But layering is the best way to work things um, on your equipment in Antarctica. A Parker jacket, which is really very, very important for getting to and from, from the zodiacs um, and before and after a stage. It's a big and it's an expensive item. If it's something you wouldn't use again, there is an option to rent parkas and also to rent um, sleeping bags that are rated to a lower degree, um, which I will share with those taking part in the races when it's necessary. Um, glacier goggles and ski goggles. So normal sunglasses are not are not sufficient enough. When the sun shines in Antarctica, which it often does for the last desert because we go in summer, um, it is so bright and it reflects against the white snow. Um, so to prevent um, snow blindness, it's really important. Balaclava and neoprene mask. Um, and then finally, a plastic container, which is about how we manage the food, which I'll talk about shortly. To um, summarize here without going through all of the items, but to make it clear, so it changes for each stage or it can change for each stage, um, but the basis is the same. And I put on here carry or wear. So these are the items generally that you are required to, to um, they're the mandatory items that you're required to have on you for the duration of enti an entire stage. Now, I always say if it's very warm, then you will be carrying a lot of it. And if it's very cold, then you will be wearing most of it. Um, so your backpack will be slightly different to how it is in a normal um, Four Deserts race. And here in the drop bag itself is, is a list of the items that you have to have there. You can put some more items in there, but you're limited to 65 litres um, for your drop bag. So food on Antarctica. So you can see here a photo of someone eating their food on the tarpaulin and the plastic boxes that they have around. So IOTA, IOTA, IATO, which is the uh, governing body for Antarctica, has very strict rules on everything. Um, and food is usually not allowed on shore in Antarctica. We have an exception, but we do have limitations and we also don't want to be um, adding any, any well, stopping Antarctica being the pristine place that it is. Um, and therefore certain things that I'll highlight now, but we'll send more detail for those people racing. So no seeds, nothing with, with, um, with seeds and no chicken products, uh, which is to do with not cross contaminating with what the penguins eat. Um, they say the more processed the food, the better. No packaging that could blow away. So you have to take the packaging out when you're on the ship, put it into its box um, for when you go to shore. Limit the food that produces crumbs. So crisps that could blow away um, in the, in, if it's a strong wind, limiting that, that type of food. Um, eating is only at the checkpoint um, and on the tarpaulin. You're not allowed to eat whilst you're out on the course. Um, food is left in its name plastic tub. And then when you get to the tarpaulin, you can you can um, open it and, and help yourself if you want to or not, if you don't want to. For the longer stages, hot water is provided and freeze dried meals are allowed. But again, you have to um, be eating them on the tarpaulin. Examples of food that work well for the last desert. So chocolate, it obviously doesn't melt there um, and it's, it's highly processed. Energy bars that don't have fresh seeds, uh, beef jerky, uh, nuts. Um, they do change their mind. They have previously not allowed them and now they do allow them. So we, we need to make sure that that's the case, but that's a, a good option. Um, and things like gels are no problem as long as you are very careful with the little extra um, bit that, that um, comes that, that you tear off the top of the gel. Um, okay, very briefly on the friends and family experience. So just really to let people know that we put this in place or we added this on to the last desert because it's a, Antarctica is a place that most people, if they even get there once in their life, will only go there once. And it is an amazing place that um, you may want to share the experience with a good friend or a family member, a husband, wife, a, um, parents, um, I said even, even some people's kids. So we introduced this um, to allow for it. It's a chance to share this once in a lifetime experience. Um, you can share a cabin with your friend and family, but you don't have to, depending on, on, on what you prefer. It is also for them an amazing way to see Antarctica because they do also have the opportunity to go and spend a lot more time on shore. Um, their options there, they can do the normal tourist activities, 
um, or they and, and or they can support the race of the races or, and they can relax on the ship. And on most days, they will get the opportunity to do a combination of all three of those. Um, but they will work with the expedition leader managing um, the, the options of things for them to do to decide. So they can actually complete a few laps with you um, when you're on the, the course, uh, or they can choose not to and just see you at the, at the end when you come back to the ship. Some of the normal tourist activities, they include zodiac, iceberg and wildlife safaris, um, snowshoeing, hiking, and even mountaineering. Um, depending again, all of their, their activities are also weather dependent, um, which makes a difference as to where, where we, we go for each stage. They, they may get the opportunity to visit bases or the only church and or post office. Um, there may be an opportunity for them to do kayaking and even one night camping on, on shore. And so it's just to let you know that that option is there. Um, and on the ship, so in the same way, all meals are included, activities and lectures are available and included, conducted by, by experts. Okay, I'm now going to move on to the frequently asked questions, which um, are put together with questions that I get asked quite often um, before we open up to, to your questions. So what is the terrain and what is the elevation? So it does completely depend on which stages or which locations we um, end up using for each of the stages. Talking through most of them. So King George Island, as mentioned, it can actually be um, gravel tracks in places. It can be deep snow and it can be icy and it can also be slushy ice because some of these um, tracks are used a little bit more regularly by people who are at the research bases on, on King George Island. And then Deception Island, you have the black sand, so you have a, a sandy um, part to it. You also have um, a lot of snow, normally not so deep because it's slightly warmer from the thermal activity or from the volcanic activity, so not so deep snow, um, but it can get icy if it, the snow melts a bit and then it freezes again all within the same stage and on some of the steeper um, sections. The other parts of, of, the, of the, sorry, the other locations, a lot of it is deep snow um, and when I say deep like normally above the knee um, rarely above the waist but there may be a little bit that is um, there so it's a, it's a real mixture and in terms of the elevation in the same way that I can't say that your race you will definitely complete 250 kilometers I can't say that you will definitely have x um, meters of uh, elevation gain um, but in general, it's, there is a lot of elevation gain in Antarctica. It's actually one of the um, uh, hilliest continents, I, I believe, underneath all the ice um, that, that's there. Uh, I think in more recent races, there's been sort of between five and 6,000 metres of elevation for those who've completed the um, 200 plus or 250 kilometres. Uh, so it is that, that there is a lot of, of up and down. Um, and then people say, what's the hardest part of the race? So the first thing is just to be clear on is that it's not an easy race, even though you're on a ship um, and you are sleeping most of the time in, in a cabin. Uh, I personally think it, what, and the terrain and the, the elevation is also quite challenging. And I think what really is the hardest part of this race compared to um, the other races is that nothing is for sure. So there's a plan and you can plan around it, but it can change all the time. And that's quite difficult for, for people when, when you're running such great distances and putting your body through something quite hard and the weather can be very challenging um, as well. And then it's not a set plan, that can be very difficult. So I feel like that's probably the hardest thing um, about this race. How is the course marked? So the course is marked using pink bags that are filled with snow, so not the flags that you're used to, um, that would could and would blow away in Antarctica. Um, I don't have an example actually here, but it's, yeah, again, like, like with the rest of the courses, it's pretty well uh, marked with these pink bags. Um, what if I reach uh, 250 kilometers, or if no one reaches 250 kilometers? So if you, uh, as a participant, reach 250 kilometres, then you don't have to continue racing. You've reached that uh, and that's the, um, that, that you've, you've achieved the goal of the race. Um, it's rare, in fact, we've never had anyone um, reach 250 kilometres before the final stage, but we have had some people reach the 250 kilometres before the time was up on that final stage. Um, 
if no one reaches 250 kilometers that's just antarctica for you so it's about as long as they've been on the course for all the time that was allowed for them um then that is is how it that, that's just the nature of antarctica um, can anyone join? So in theory, yes, um, but you do need to qualify by completing two of the other four deserts races um, in order to um, join the last desert in Antarctica. Um, the other thing for, for friends and family, friends and family of Racing the Planet participants, um, staff, volunteers, etc. There's no limitation to, to um, people who can or can't join. Um, how do I get to Ushuaia? Very briefly, the most common route is you fly into Buenos Aires in Argentina and then take a direct flight, um, which is two hours direct flight down to, to Ushuaia. The um, flights are, they're reliable, but the weather, when the weather is difficult or weather is, is um, windy or cold or, or, or challenging for flying, it's often, it's quite common that there are delays and cancellations. And normally you can get there within a few hours or within the next day, but it is worth noting that when you're planning your, your travel. How heavy will my pack be? So I touched on it briefly already, um, but if it's, if it's full, if it's a warmish day and you're running in, in um, just the, the minimum amount, it won't be shorts and t-shirt, but the minimum amount of gear, your pack will probably weigh close on 10 kilos as it, as it would um, in a or 20 plus pounds as it would in a normal four deserts race. But if it's very cold and you're wearing a lot of the gear, then your pack may actually be as low as uh, five kilos. Um, so it's, it's a little different in, in, in that respect to the other races. And I will touch on this also briefly. When people are running in the last desert, so primarily what they're wearing is a pair of trail shoes. Um, some people choose Gore-Tex just because it's waterproof and you are running in, in snow or a waterproof sock instead. Um, some people prefer not to. People will normally wear just either thermal running tights or a couple of pairs of, of normal running tights. Um, and then a pair of waterproof trousers uh, over the top just for, for the wind protection as well as against the, um, the snow or precipitation if there, if there is any oil that's been blown up. And then on top they'll be wearing um, a number of layers, uh, normally some form of base layer um, and different weights of base layers topped with a waterproof jacket and then hats, gloves um, or hat or balaclava gloves um, and, and either ski goggles or glacier glasses, normally one or the other um, at most times. What is a drop bag for? So I've touched on this. I'm not going to go into it again now, but if you need me to reiterate, then ask me in the Q&A. Um, can I bring snowshoes or, or other um, equipment items? So there's the mantra equipment list that you must bring. As with the other races, you can bring other items, but if you start a stage with an item, then you have to finish the stage with the item uh, or, or you lose it. Um, the same goes, for example, with an SLR, SLR or an expensive or heavy cam piece of camera equipment. Yes, you can bring it, but if you start the stage with it, you have to finish the stage with it. But you can change that equipment um, for each of the stages. And so the same applies with snowshoes. I am asked quite often, you can bring snowshoes, um, but the terrain varies quite a lot, both during the stage and from stage to stage. And most people have decided in the end that um, the fact that you might have to carry them for some of the time makes it not worth it, but it, they are allowed. Why don't we race on the planet fly to Antarctica? So Mary touched on it briefly, but the main reason, just to be very clear, is that the flights are very unreliable. Um, the ships normally stick to a certain schedule and within a few days, um, they, they will change their schedules. You might get a day less or a day more in Antarctica if they've had to go further, faster or slower or around a storm or wait for a storm. But the, the flights can be easily delayed a few days or a week or even sometimes more than a month. And that's all very well if you're doing a six month expedition to Antarctica, but that's not great if you're doing a um, six stage race in Antarctica, you're gonna be there for just a week or so. Um, and with all of us, we all have busy lives and other things going on. So that's the reason that we have chosen to take the ship. It takes longer to get there, but it's a bit more reliable so that we can be clearer on, on our itinerary and schedule. Will I see peng penguins? 99.9% .9 you will see penguins. Um, we have always seen penguins and, and hundreds of them, and they are amazing creatures. 
What is the cost of the last desert? So the entry fee is um, 12,900 US dollars um, for participants. So it's obviously a lot more than a normal four deserts race, um, but Antarctica is a very expensive place to, to get to. <clears throat> um, and for the friends and family, it's a little less than that, um, but along those lines. Finally, just to be clear, the dates for 2021 and 2022. So 2021 is the 11th of November to the 23rd of November in 2021. Uh, and in 2022, we have the um, conf almost confirmed dates and almost confirmed that it's gonna happen in 2022 is the 24th of November to the 6th of December. Um, we, for this year's, we only have very limited number of places. Um, because the ship is already full uh, with other, other um, passengers and it's been quite popular as well. Um, so it's not that easy to get places on the ships going to Antarctica at the moment, but there are some people doing the race, planning to do the race um, that have places held that may choose to change. So if you are interested in this year, let me know, although I appreciate it's a diff difficult year to plan such a big trip with so much travel. Um, gonna finish with a few minor top tips. Arrive in Ushuaia a couple of days before the race, mainly to make sure that you get there in time for the ship to leave and don't miss the ship because there can be delays, but also because Ushuaia and that part of the world is beautiful. Bring seasick or motion sickness medication. It is a mandatory item. Uh, most people don't actually struggle too much with the um, crossing of the Drake Passage, um, but almost everyone has medication with them, um, which helps with that. Be prepared for four seasons in one day. So when you're thinking about starting the stage, don't look at what the weather is now or even what the forecast is, is going to be. Even if we give you the forecast, the weather in Antarctica changes so fast and you do not want to be out there on a stage with, without um, the, the clothing and the equipment that you need to make sure that you can stay warm, dry and safe. Otherwise, that will be the end of your race if you need to access your drop bag. Um, bring multiple clothing items. So I said you can bring two, I would, I would recommend, for example, two pairs of trail shoes. Most of us have them um, so that you can, uh, it gives you a fighting chance to start each stage with, with dry clothing and shoes. The same, like bring extra socks, bring extra gloves, things that are definitely going to get wet um, so that you can change them in um, from stage to stage. Be ready to be flexible. Um, Antarctica rules, the weather rules. Most important is to keep you safe. And that means that we have to make a lot of, a lot of changes. Um, and finally, always give way to penguins or any other wildlife on Antarctica. This isn't so much a tip as a rule, um, but it is amazing when we're out on the course and we're out there for quite a long time, that the penguins actually come and start using the trails that we've made as their slides or for them to play on. Um, and they have the right of way. So if penguins on your course, you have to take a wide berth around it or wait until it's finished doing whatever it's doing and moved on. Um, it will affect your time, but it's also one of those unique, amazing experiences of Antarctica. Okay, and that brings me to the end of me talking here. Um, so I am now going to open up the um, open up to any questions that you have. So you're all mainly muted. If you have a question, just unmute yourself and and ask away. Um, can I just have another question about shoes? A lot of a lot of things have been covered in the questions, um, uh, and obviously you've, you've listed mandatory uh, gaiters by a particular company. Um, but if you've got um, running shoes with spikes in, can you run in those and carry the gaiters? Um, just quickly clarifying, so it's not the gaiters from a specific company, it's the micro spikes. Um, right, okay, yeah, which, micro spikes. Is, and um, I personally wouldn't recommend the shoes with spikes because it doesn't give you the option for not having the spikes on there. Mm -hmm. Um, in theory, no, the answer is no, you can't not bring the Katoomla micro spikes um, if you've got the spikes on it. But I can talk to you specifically about what shoes it is that you've got and whether they would um, whether they would suffice as a as a um, replacement. If, if people can change what's in their bags, are they checking the mandatory equipment every day? We're not checking the mandatory equipment every single day of every single person. Um, but we will check it some days of everybody and um, ad hoc of others. 
And if anybody has any concerns about what someone is carrying and someone else isn't, you just need to tell us and we will, we will, we will check it. Uh, um, I have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a gross question, but I have to ask it. Um, in the regular four deserts, it's easy to go to the bathroom. <laughs> You're in the middle of everywhere. And how do you how do you do that in Antarctica? So it's not a gross question at all. We're all used to, especially when you've been to one four deserts race, you're used to talking about toilets and the color of your pee and how many times you've pooped today. So it's not a not a gross question at all. Um, it's a very it's a very good question. So obviously on the ship, that's easy. You have bathrooms, you use them. On shore, we have a toilet, um, normally just the one that's at the at a checkpoint along the course. Um, so we ask that unless there is something that really is out of your control, that you wait and you use that toilet. So they ask on Antarctica that you don't use, even if you're just having a pee, that you don't use, um, that you don't go al fresco, you actually use the toilet that we have to have um, and, and that is there and available for you. There's normally a tent around the toilet, but if the weather is particularly windy or particularly bad, there may not be a tent around the toilet. It won't be right next door to a checkpoint, but just to um, give you a reality check on it, and you, but you still need to, still need to, to, to use that. Thank you. <laughs> I have a question, Sam. Yeah. How long are the longest loops and how short is the shortest loop? So the longest loop that, that we've ever had, I wanna say is 20 kilometers. Mary okay. may be able to correct me on that, but the shortest that we've ever had is like a kilometer. Ah. Um, but as you saw from the example there, normally when the, the um, course of the, the loop is, is shorter, then you are on shore for less time, normally. Okay. Um, but often you'll find that, again, given the conditions, um, a three kilometer um, uh, course takes a lot longer than it would running on a three kilometer um, track in, in the wood because you're talking about deep snow and things. So it's all very different and very relative. But to give you an idea, you're mainly talking um, longest 20, shortest around one, um, but probably most of them are going to be between five and between three and 10, I suppose, um, with the one which is always longer. Mm -hmm. And, and another question about, about uh, carrying your um, the mandatory equipment. Now, when it comes to the, to the food, the, the mandatory food or whatever food you need for your six days during the race, do you carry them for six days in your running pack every single day? Or do you take out the food that you need for that specific stage and the rest stays on the ship? Like, is that counted? Like, because that's also obviously mandatory. If you have to have whatever this amount of food so so no so for each stage you only have to carry the food that you need for that stage and the rest okay. of it can stay on the ship okay um and, and fact, actually um okay. oh sorry sheila i was i was yes. just going to mention and in fact the food that you carry for that stage is not um carried in your pack but it's actually left on the on the tarp your the the sort of okay. che checkpoint eating point I see. So in your backpack is basically all the, yes, everything else, like the clothing and all the other emergency. Okay. And, and water that you do and water, carry with yes. you. So and the all... sleeping bag stays, uh, sorry, is the sleeping bag, bag stays on the ship or it goes in your drop bag? That stays in the drop bag. In the drop bag. Okay. Yeah. So okay. any gels, any snacks, everything goes on that orange top in Correct. the box. Correct. Yeah. For the day, okay. And you're never going to be, um, well, I, I want to say you're very rarely going to be more than five kilometers from that orange tarp because some of the, the courses you have, they're either figure of eight or there's more than one of them out, out there. Mm. And you can stop as often as you like at the tarp um, to, to stop and, and eat. Obviously, that, that takes away from the chance that you have to, to run the distance. And we're talking about the minimum distance. You just can't stop for a long time all the time um, so that people aren't just there for no reason. <laughs> um, I saw a lot of people, sorry. In, in the desert, obviously we're carrying a lot of water because I mean, you, you lose a lot of water when you're running in the snow as well, because it's hard work. There's a lot of people in the photos, both carrying two bottles if it's in loops 
and you can come back every five k's or ten k's. Can you refill water each time you come back? Yes, you can, um, and but it will take more time the, the more that you you come back. Um, so we prefer that you have um, the ability to carry one and a half liters of water on you as you would in a in a normal um, hot desert race. You don't have to fully fill them up every single time. Yeah, you can fill every time you come back round to to the checkpoint. Um, just yeah. a, another addition to the water question, because you said a loop could be as far as 20 kilometers. That sounds like a long time without water, but I don't really know how much water you need uh, in those conditions. So you will rarely be more than five kilometers from a checkpoint because some of the oh. courses, they'll do either a figure of eight um, type type setup, or there will be more than one uh, place where you can get water there. So it's, oh, okay. it's very unlikely that you're going to be more than five kilometers from that checkpoint. If you are, you're going to be told um, in advance of that stage happening. So then you can so plan you your water. You wouldn't be alone for, for 20K for, the, for a whole loop. You'd, you'd, uh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, no. yeah I, ha I have one more question. Um, you were mentioning, okay, the 20, uh, 2021 race, you were mentioning there's limited spots. Right now you roughly have 30, maybe 31. How many more, if the country gets back to semi-normal, how many more spots are there available for 2021? Right now there's around 30, 31. Where, where, where's the cap this year? So it's, it's a little complicated, but we possibly have the opportunity for an additional um, five people to join. Oh, that's it's it. It's based on the number of people on, on the ship. However, the people that are currently registered, some of them may not be able to make it for various travel restriction reasons. And there are some of people that we're holding a place for whilst we, whilst we wait. So if you're genuinely serious about 2021, then, and we know, Warren, we have you um, on, on the list. So we will let you know when it gets to critical point, but we will also be saying to those people that currently set for 2021, if it's difficult and any changes want to be made that they can let us know and we can make um, alternative transfers or, or the like. All right, yeah, uh, I'd like to do 2021. I haven't set my deposit in only because the country is still level four red yeah. for travel warning. That's that's why, so, okay. But 2022 basically is pretty open. We haven't we haven't opened it officially yet. We just um, finalized right. the dates recently. So yeah, that's, okay. that one is. All right, All right. I got it, thank you. Uh, talking of numbers, did, did it always sell out? It does always sell out. Um, it has to on both ways. So it's based on, so it's not like the, the desert races where you can have another tent and you can extend or reduce. It's based on okay. sleeping places on a ship. Um, and without going into too much more detail about it, the bulk of the cost is the ship that's going across. Okay. So we can't, and, and we have to secure those places a long time in advance because they are popular um, for the general public, et cetera. So it does always sell out because it has to, uh, but we always have the limited places um, as well. It's always a smaller, a smaller race. Sure, and does it sell out quickly? <laughs> I mean, do we have to sort of on the buttons? Honestly, it depends from, from year to year. Just answering what Warren was saying. So 2021, we, we still have a few places as options and we're just being yeah. very as flexible as we can with those people that um, are moving across from 2020, already been very understanding. Um, it, it fills up relatively fast, but then there's, it is so hard to say, Felix. I mean, I, I'd say six months out, really, as a minimum is where you want to be focused, but there could be an opportunity for a place beyond that. Okay, thanks. I, I don't know why I'm even asking, because once your mind's made up, uh, <laughs> you went to, to end, well, but thanks. For those of us um, that are from last year, going this year, if it all falls apart again, hopefully it doesn't, I'm desperate to go. Um, but if it does fall flat again, do we get it postponed to the next year? Uh, yes, 100% postponed to the next year. Um, and we will talk to each of you individually about the circumstance, said you've all been so patient um, so far. Um, about the patient. I hey Sam, I know you've got limited uh, spots. Do you give preference to the rate to the racers, or I mean, could, you don't want to have like more than half as family and friends and not have racers, right? Preference is always to the racers, um, Dave. Always, but obviously you reach a certain deadline where 
you opening up a, um, a few places. And if we've got people who are interested and want to place um, racing and we know about them, then they definitely get priority. But if we don't know about them, we're not holding places just for um, just for racers. So yeah, it's the friends and family is an add on really to to make it um, more acceptable to people's families and to be able to share that experience. But it's definitely it's absolutely it's about it's about the race and the racers primarily. Oh, one more. Where would you recommend to stay in Yeshua? In, what, what hotel you have a recommend? Which is close to the ship? Yeah. So there's a. I'll send out a list to people who are. Um, and actually, Warren, I can send it to you, but as well. But people who are registered will get the list of recommended hotels. There's oh, okay. a lot of options in Yeshua. Okay. There really are right. a lot. There's one right opposite where the um, where we get on board the the ship, right opposite the port. It's not a great hotel, but it is very <laughs> convenient. Um, there's some other really nice ones that are a little, not like still in town centre, but a little further out, but I'll send a list of options um, of, of all price range. And then there's the place where we, we have the meeting and I'll let you know that that as well, if you're able okay, to. Okay, thank there. you. Yeah. Good. I have, I have, sorry, I have one more question. Sometimes um, you said we have to be flexible and we could be going at any time and it's daylight all the time. Is it possible that we would finish a stage and then five hours later, start another. It's possible. So um, we could be like doing 100 kilometers, well, 80 or whatever, and then, you know, sleep five hours and have to start again. But we're, we're reasonable within it as well. So you're not going to, we're not going to have you out there for 24 hours and then have like a two hour break and then you're out for another 24 hours. So it's reasonable as well. Um, but it, it, you could be out there for eight hours, have a five hour break and go out there for another four hours. Um, so it, and, and it is difficult on the mind and also on the body, but that is definitely one of the challenges, um, of, of the race, the challenges and the, the sort of memories from it. But yes, it is possible that you have a very short break between them, but with, with being, being reasonable, um, to people. Thank you. Good. Well, on that point, then I'm, I'm going to um, to close it down because, as always, I've run over. So I apologize for that. Um, I can see that there was a lot of chat in the chat, but I haven't looked at it specifically. So I will send that around and share it with people if there was questions um, and comments that were relevant. And if you have any other questions that you either think of later or you didn't want to ask publicly, feel free to email me or you can email Mary's and Mary's been there now eight times. This will be her ninth time, um, hopefully this year when we when we go, uh, has a lot of experience of it and we're happy to answer questions or, or even set up a separate call with you. So that note, I'm gonna say it was really nice to, to see you all and great questions coming up, which I think will have benefited everyone. Thank you for listening to me drone on for so long. And I will send the notes, the recording um, and, and some specific information across on email. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks Bye. 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 Thank you. Nice to see lots of you again. And Bye -bye. hopefully we'll uh, see you in Argentina. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs>